to do. What I do have is a a bag full of topics that I put together when I first started the show that's been sat in the corner for about 10 or 11 weeks or maybe a bit more since the beginning of March when we first started. Uh, so I might dip into that and see if that triggers off a conversation. At some point I'll do that today. Um, what else were I going to talk about? We're talking about flow. So in terms of Flow is basically the absence of resistance. That's so you can define it as nothing getting in the way, which is absence of resistance. Or you can define it as uh, a clear channel to a, a a point that you're aiming at, or a clear channel to being here now. Is kind of how I want to want to describe it because I want to keep it in the present moment if I can. So. Flow and present moment is a bit of a contradiction, but the flow is, in my world at the moment, the way I'm visualizing it, is from uh, mind into a physical level of mind, maybe. So that's kind of where my flow definition is. So moving from... Uh, one frequency of mind into a physical frequency of mind is the flow that I'm talking about. So when your when your uh, attention is embodied physically, when you ground totally grounded, totally in the moment, full attention on one thing, that kind of level of of concentration and an appreciation of the moment. And I'm sure there's a more technical psychological definition, but I'm I'm happy with the one that I've got for the time being. It makes sense to me. And uh, I'll, I prefer to keep things simple if I can, rather than going for academic versions of stuff. Academic can be interesting as background, but uh, I can usually simplify it down to three or four Free, key phrases, and that's that keeps me happy. Uh, I've got some friends in Newcastle who are kind of not well, are academic philosophers in their own way. They they run like the Newcastle Philosophy Society, which I was part of for years. Uh, ran their website and ran a group for them, and was part of a a group we set up a school of philosophy at one point uh which is was basically just four people meeting in a cafe on a saturday morning but uh but it was a regular every week saturday morning and there was a there was a curriculum of sorts and there was a there was a kind of sequence of events that we that we took people through uh, not not my it was my idea but the actual implementation of it was was mostly other people. I just came, I just, I arrived at the Newcastle Philosophy Society and announced that I wanted to set up a school of philosophy for for no particular reason except that it was in my head to do it, and I didn't know why. I, I, it was in my head to set up a school, and I, and I was at the Philosophy Society, so it seemed like the logical thing that it would be a a school of philosophy. So we ended up going through a process over about a year and a half it took to actually set it up. And then it ran for probably another two years. And it's still kind of going in the background. It's not part of the philosophy society anymore. But the, the, there'll, there'll be a meeting on Skype as we speak. Uh, so they're still doing Saturday afternoon meetings now rather than Saturday mornings. But... Uh, it was an interesting process for me because I was welcomed in uh, very, very openly. It was a very much a process of being welcomed and engaged and involved in that particular group of people. And uh, 
Yeah, so I ended up sitting in on on planning meetings and philosophy society board meetings and all that sort of thing that, that kind of happens when you just when you walk into somewhere. And it's taken ages to get there. It took me a year to actually get through the door. Uh, so I had, and and when I when I actually got there. Uh, I got to the door of the the literary and the philosophical and, and literature society, the library, which is where the philosophy society has their meetings. And I got to the door of a a Tuesday night meeting, I think it was. And I turned around and, and went home again, because I went because I just I couldn't work out why, or what, or or I couldn't find a reason to to go through the door at that point. So I went back about a week later on a Saturday. Well, not even a week later, just the, the following Saturday. And I got to the Saturday morning meeting. So sometimes it takes me a couple of tries to actually get through the door. And sometimes it takes me a year to get to the point where I'm almost at the door. Uh, so it's a slow process for me, but it's it's worthwhile because it's a slow process i think because i don't rush it seems to embed more deeply for me because i take my time and i i, I think things through a little bit more sometimes a bit too much but i tend to think about things before i do them and then think about them as I'm doing them, and then think about them after I'm doing them. So, so there's three phases of now. There's the now that's before the event, the now that's the event, and the now that's after the event. If that makes any sense at all. So, so that's how process works in the now. I've just explained it to myself. There you go. So that's how you that's how you marry those two concepts together. So flow and in the moment. That's how it works. You just you just expand the definition of moment to include before and after a specific event. And you've got a you've got a concept that includes flow within the now. So there you go. I'm interested in both of those things. I'm interested in the in the here and now aspect of everything because that's one of the key concepts that I, that I carry around with me is is being as much in in the here and now as possible. Yeah, the world's a big place, so the only bit of it, the only bit of the world that I can really deal with is the bit that that is here and now for me. Is this a protocol for the process of flow? Says Doc Time. Um, it kind of is, yeah. I've turned, I knew I was going to talk about flow, but I didn't realise it was going to be a long speaking about flow. So, so yeah, to, to marry the two together is kind of the idea. So if you define, you define here and now and then expand here and now to include just before and just after, you can kind of fit the flow into the now that way. Uh, so, yeah. I think that kind of works in its own way. It's, it's you've got to be you've got to be quite chilled out to be able to do it though. If there's any stress involved in in the here and now, you're not gonna you're probably not gonna be able to to expand it out because you'll be so focused on dealing with the stress that you can't you can't just naturally expand it out. So you've got to you've got to kind of be on a 
on a fairly chilled out mode, which is like, which I am this afternoon. Which so that's why I'm I'm really just talking about the way I am at the moment, uh, as a as a way of talking about flow. All right, so this is this was originally going to be related to the the metaphysics of money, which I was talking about uh, a few shows ago. So, in terms of in terms of manifestation, and in terms of uh, manifesting money, uh, I go back to uh, Joseph Murphy, who's interesting in terms of uh, manifesting money. It's very much talking about the the relationship between the conscious and the subconscious mind, and how the conscious can can drop seeds into the subconscious, and then they and then they grow. So that and combine that with with some some ideas of new thought. And if you if you think about the mind as being as the conscious mind as being male, and the subconscious mind as being female, the, the the subconscious is the fertile part. That's the womb. That's the part that gives birth to whatever it is that you want to manifest in the physical world. So to get to a place where you're planting seeds, you have to be in a a place of of flow. The the process of of being relaxed and being in a kind of meditative state, but but with attention, not with loose attention, with with a, an attention that's very that's quite focused. That becomes the seed, the seed planting part. So, in terms, Neville Goddard talks about it in terms of uh, living. Living in the wish fulfilled, sitting in the wish fulfilled. So, in order to generate, uh, I don't know. For, I usually use my the example of me finding this flat, but that's a bit. That's about six months old now, so I have to find another example. Oh, I, there's an example using this job that I'm doing now. So. A couple of years ago, when I realised that nobody else was going to give me a job, uh, and I had to go back to work at the place that I'd already been working a few years ago, I set that up in my mind as as just waiting for something to confirm that that's the right thing to do. So I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, all right, so if it happens by accident. Then it's the right thing to do. If it happens with synchronicity, then it's the right thing for me to do at this at this particular point in time. So again, a process of flow. So I was at the I was at the soup kitchen on a Thursday evening, and they uh, they people queue up to get their food. It's an outside van under the ar under the railway arches. So I was there, I'd, and I wasn't particularly hungry. I didn't really need food that much, so. But I was there just because it's one of the places that I was spending time, and I just and at some point I was in the queue and I decided no, I don't want the food, I want to go home. So I jumped on the on the public transit system here, and uh, where I was living at the time is about three three miles outside of of town, so it takes about what twenty five minutes twenty minutes on the metro system. To get from the centre of town to where I was living, and to do and to do that, you go through uh, Gateshead, Felling, uh, Sunderland Road. So there's three three stops be in between uh, before you get to Hewith, which is where I was living. So I jumped on the metro just because I I decided I didn't want the food, so. I'm there, and I'm, I bumped into somebody that was working at this at the company that I used to work for, a, a friend of mine um, that I hadn't seen for ages. 
um, and she was traveling home. So we had a conversation about whether they were taking on staff, uh, whether I wanted to work there or not, which I said I did, because I'd already kind of worked through the process of letting go of my resistance to going back to work for them, which, which took quite a while, but in the end I did it. And I took that to be, all right, if they're taking on staff, there's a chance meeting on a, on a public transport system. They're taking on staff. There's a, new, there's a new guy running the team that I don't know. There's, there's a possibility there might be an okay place to work, uh, given that it was about four years since I'd last worked for them, or five years even. So things change in that, in that particular business in five years, so you can't tell. So I had to go in with an open mind, but I took the synchronicity as as significant, and and my friend passed on my number to the new team leader. He was looking for staff, so he rang me. I went in for an interview, uh, got on with him quite well, and he asked me to start the following following Monday, which was just over a year ago. So I've been with this company just over a year. Uh, if you include the, the lockdown period, I started in May last year. But it was based on a chance meeting on the way home on public transport. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't something that I had any control over, except that I'd let go of the resistance. And I had the idea in my head that if it came up, if if I bumped into somebody, which some, I, I'd bumped into people before that worked worked there, and I bumped into into this particular person before, so I knew there was a possibility that I might bump into somebody, but I didn't go out of my way to bump into anybody. It just happened. It happened as a natural process, uh, and it happened as a natural process because I'd let go of the resistance to going back to work for them. And I'm, I'm in the same position now where I have to let go of the resistance uh, of going back to work for them. So I think, we, I, think I need to do a little bit of uh, emotional freedom technique. So I'm rambling a bit. But you get the idea, Doc, it's the synchronicity that makes it flow. For me, that's, that's how it manifests for me it's chance meetings and and having something in my head that that I want to do I have to have, have to have happen and the, the flow happens because the resistance is gone so that so the first stage of flow so the it flows here and now the that the here and now before that is letting go of the resistance. So the extended version of here and now is letting go of the resistance, which creates or allows something to happen. I don't know whether it creates it, but it just allows it to happen. It's an acceptance process. Right, so I'll do a little bit of emotional freedom technique just because I'm on the, on the topic so it makes sense so whatever resistance you've got to whatever is coming up just replace your version into, into what I'm doing for me so I'm, I'll, I'll keep this vague I'll keep it broad and just use it as a as a as a kind of framework for putting your own your own version of resistance to, for your own uh, flow into this into this thing. So, so to start with, I need to find out uh, what my scale is between zero and ten of uh, of resistance. Uh, I think it's about a six. I'm about a five or a six. So it's, if I can get that down to a two, I'll be a happy man.
I'll be a very happy man because if I get it down to a two, it means that my, my production at work will go up and I'll make more money. Because I know that's what's getting in the way. I've got no doubt it's getting, that that's what's getting in the way. It's me getting in the way of myself. And it almost always is me getting in the way of myself when these things happen. So, just a reminder, I'm, I'm using my right hand, the fingers of my right hand, to tap on the inside of my, of my left hand. So, four fingers on the what's called the karate chop point. And I'll just set this up as uh, letting go of, of resistance. So even though I have this uh, resistance to being back at work and my resistance to, to the way things have changed, I wholly and completely love, honour and accept myself. And even though I sometimes remember the not so good things that have happened in that com in the company I work for. They're in the past. They're in the past now. This is a different situation. It's a different team leader. It's a different manager. It's a different way of doing things. And it could work out all right. You never know. You never know. You know. I have to be open to it to find out. So even though... It's a precarious situation financially and the company's starting from scratch again and they're building up so the, the rules are different now because we're starting from the beginning again. Even though it's a different situation and things have changed, I wholly and completely love, honour and accept myself. So all this resistance, this resistance that I feel in my body, in my stiffness of my, my limbs, my arms and my legs have been stiff the last week. My sleeping pattern's been off. All of these things are resistance that I'm feeling in my body. And even though those things are there, they're there to to show me something, to to bring something into my consciousness. So even though I have some resistance to here and now, I wholly and completely love, honour and accept myself. All right, I'm just checking with my body again, see how we're doing. I think my shoulders have loosened up a little bit. I'm not sure whether my tone of voice has changed or not, but because I was quite chilled out to begin with. But uh, I think my shoulders have loosened up a little bit. So that's a victory. And I'm down to about a four now, four or a three possibly. So I'll do one more round, see if I can... See if I can get down to two. If I can get down to two, then I'm happy. So even though there is some resistance around, I've got resistance to wearing a mask, which I might have to do next week. Uh, because wearing a mask is now compulsory on public transport in Newcastle. So it's... Uh, something I'm going to have to deal with. So even though I'm, I'm resisting wearing a mask, 
I wholly and completely love, honour and accept myself. And even though I know masks don't really work and I know they're a placebo to keep people happy, I know it's a political thing that pacifies people and gives people the ability to move around without being as much in fear as they were. I wholly and completely love, honour and accept myself. So even though I might have to wear a mask and I'm a little bit resistant, I do honour myself. I do respect my whatever decision I make, whether I decide I want to wear a, a scarf instead of a mask, or whether I go out and buy a mask, whatever the decision I decide to make next week. I wholly and completely love, honour and accept myself. Because it doesn't matter in the great scheme of things. It doesn't make a big difference to my life. It's just part of what's going on. It's part of here and now. And I'm part of here and now. In fact, I am here and now. There is nowhere else to be. There is only here and now. So I'll just check in again because I think that that loosened something up and, and I've just let go of it so I think I'm down to a two now I'm down to a two I still don't know whether I'm going to go out and buy a mask or not though So there's a there's a shop over the over the street from me, next to the fish and chip shop, that sells sanitizing hand gel and face masks, and I've got a feeling that they're pricing them quite high. So I'm going to have to find a a, a pound shop version. If I'm going to buy one, I'm not spending a lot of money doing it. So I might have to buy disposable, but Either way, I'm not spending a lot of money. And I might just end up wearing a scarf. Because I can get if I can get away with wearing a scarf, then I'll do that. Or I could just walk to work, potentially. It's about a 35-minute walk. A 40-minute walk. So I could potentially walk, but uh, either way. Right, I did say I was going to dig into this bag of topics. I can't remember any of the things that I wrote on here, but uh, there will be something, no doubt. All right, I've got Neville Goddard written on here, which is... Uh, appropriate for what we were doing earlier on in terms of imagination so I'll talk about Neville Goddard again because it's always worth doing you can never talk too much about Neville Goddard in my book uh, even though it's quite biblical language uh, he, Neville Goddard talks about imagination creating reality which is definitely my experience since I started uh, listening to the audio books. There's plenty of audio books on, on YouTube.
And if imagination does create reality, that means that I'm in complete control of the reality that I'm living in. Even though it might not look like like I am, it means that I do have the ability to, to change it with my imagination. So as a kind of example of that, I can probably talk a little bit about uh, a guy. A guy I met at the soup kitchen, uh, who I've spoken to a few times. And I spent about twenty minutes talking to him one one time in the queue outside, just as just as this COVID nineteen thing started happening. So we weren't allowed in the building. They had to give people food from outside, from the van. So there was a long queue, uh, and I spent a long time speaking to Graham. And in the process of that, I'm using my imagination, and I'm imagining, imagining him as somebody who has the ability to deal with life and has the ability to to move forward in his life and be able to manage all situations in his life. So I'm just using my imagination and having having a conversation with him in my head, congratulating him on the on his ability to deal with stuff that's going on. I've, I've spoken to him since, and I don't know whether he was not able to deal with stuff stuff that was going on but um, I'm just using this as an example uh, I've spoken to him since and he seems perfectly happy in himself uh, even though he's he's got some uh, issues with schizophrenia and homeless he seems perfectly happy in himself so I don't know whether me doing that makes any difference at all, but that's the principle of how Neville Goddard explains imagination. Imagination creating reality. So in terms of having conversations in my mind with the people around me to improve the relationships, to start a relationship that's only just beginning, or to build on relationships that I've had for a little while that have gone a bit rocky here and there, uh, to build up the rapport and build up the friendship. Um, I can do that with other people in my life as well. There are other people in my life that I meet occasionally in groups that I've got a bit of a rocky relationship with. Sometimes we're friends, sometimes we're enemies, but it's never dull. It's more, it's much more of a, a drama relationship than anything else. And I prefer not to have too much drama, if at all possible, so I can use my imagination to, to rehearse. It's like a mental rehearsal, the way that, the way that a sportsman would, a, a, in the way that a tennis player or a golfer would mentally rehearse the shots that they're playing. This is this, this is a similar kind of thing, but it's Neville Goddard's version. So this this sports science would probably back this up in terms of sport, and he's using the Bible to back it up. But the, the principle is exactly the same. So it's kind of a mental rehearsal of how you want things to go. And with, in Neville Goddard's case, he assumes that everybody is God. So, or everybody is Christ in his language. So he uses Christ as a, as a way of talking about imagination. He equates imagination with, with Christ. Christ consciousness or whatever you want to call it.
So that's, it's an interesting approach. Uh, I'm using it more and more. I use it to improve the relationships with people at work as well. And it seems to work that way. Where I imagine people being supportive. Then they tend to be supportive. So that's interesting in itself, in and of itself. It means it's testable. If I, if I imagine having a row with somebody who's normally supportive, and then three days later I have a row with them, then that's it's a testable thing in terms of personal experience, maybe not in terms of science, but definitely worth looking at. So that's, that's Neville Goddard. I had, uh, I've got master slave dialectic on here as well, which is Hegel, George Hegel. So the, the master slave dialectic that Hegel's talking about is in consciousness. He's talking about dominant ideas and less dominant ideas. So that kind of ties into to Neville Goddard as well. Because a dominant idea in imagination is the is the one that produces reality, but if there's a if there's an opposite idea in there as well, it cancels out the dominant idea. So in some ways, Neville Goddard's use of imagination is an equivalent or a version of. Hegel's master-slave dialectic. Uh, it's different language, and Hegel's very, very dense. But uh, it's 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 almost the equivalent. Hegel is an uh, early 18th century, uh, late actually. It was about the, about the time of the of the French Revolution, about the time of Napoleon. And through to 1807, I think he produced Phenomenology of Spirit. So that's early 19th century. I got the century wrong. Uh, early 19th century, let's say, 18th and early 19th century is Hegel. German, German idealism, which is another one of those things that assumes that everything is mind. It's another one of one of those things that uh, is worth looking into. It's very dense, though, German idealism. The language, German language is very, it's very cryptic in a way. They're talking about simple things, but using multi-syllable compound words. Uh, and you can do it just by saying imagination creates reality. If you, if you have to. That's the, that's the way that I prefer to say it. Um, probably not going to get into, into Hegel very much, but if anybody's interested, there's a thing called Half Hour Hegel, which is on YouTube, which is a guy called Greg, Greg Sadler, who's a philosopher, an American philosopher, who goes through a, a book that was called Phenomenology of Spirit, which is incredibly dense and incredibly complex language. And what Hegel's saying in Phenomenology of Spirit is, is basically that there's a process going on in consciousness. There's kind of a battle going on internally in consciousness. And there's a, there's a, there's a flow within consciousness. Let's bring it back to flow. So the, the flow between two extremes that produces another level. Yeah, I agree with that, Doc. Time reality is created by our imagination. It's created by our... Most of it's created by our collective imagination. 
but some of it's created by individual imagination as well. You, you've got a certain amount of control about how things happen. And to some extent about when they happen as well. You have to make the assumption that all is mind though, to do it. I read something the other day that was, that, that was interesting about, about thought. It's that speech is loud thought and thought is quiet thought. So they're two ends of the scale, if you like. Quite. So thought is quiet speech and speech is loud thought. So that's that to some extent is is a it's two ends of the spectrum trying to find the middle the thought is trying to get out into speech and has to find a way through to be expressed in whatever language it's expressed in if i was hegel then it it would be multi-syllable compound german language but if I'm Neville Goddard, it's it's simple comp concepts. I prefer the simple end of that scale, but but I can go to the complex if I have to. I can go there. So the flow is internal as well. The flow is within internal consciousness as much as it is in external in the external world. And. Getting things moving is uh, is an interesting part of the process. The initiation of the of the flow. The initiation can just be a, a simple thing like a decision to change something. It can just be that. It can just be moving house. It can just be as simple as deciding that you have to go back to work. In my case. And then working through the blocks, working through the resistance to getting there. But once I've made the decision that I to to change anything, I need to have a, a cash flow coming in. And to get the cash flow coming in, I have to go back to work. And the only place that will employ me at the at that particular point in time is is the place that I used to work at. So I had to get over my own internal resistance to the process and to the flow. And I know this is a bit repetitive, but sometimes repetition is a good thing because it just emphasizes the point and I'm trying to emphasize how important it is to, to have a way to let go of resistance. Because you won't flow unless you let go. You won't flow unless you... In my case, it was deciding that I'm prepared to pay £500 a month for, for rent, for a good place to live, which I'd never, never done before. I'd always been on the, the lower end of the rent scale. And I've always lived in places that are at the low end of the housing market. So it was a big shift for me that. So once I just once I'd let go of my resistance to paying the money, that's what shifted me into being able to get this this place. And sometimes it can be as simple as that. Sometimes it's just making a decision that if if you want somewhere that's reasonable to live, you've got to be prepared to pay the money. And once you just accept that, then the place will show up and the money will show up. Or the, ideally, the money shows up first and then the place shows up and then the furniture shows up and the electrical goods show up. And then you work it out from there. But that's the flow, that's the flow of that process. And it seemed it went very smoothly for me because I'd taken out the resistance beforehand. 
So just a reminder, you're listening to uh, Revolution Radio. Uh, we're at freedomslips.com. Uh, this show is called Free Association. My name's Dennis. Um, I'm going to be here at the same time next week, which is 4 p.m. UK time, 11 a.m. East Coast time in the States. Uh, we've been talking about flow in the context of uh, metaphysics of money. And about how to let go of resistance and about how to let go of anything that seems like it might be resistance, which is a lot of a lot of emotions. Uh, thanks for being here, Doc Time. I appreciate you. And thanks to everybody else in the chat room. If you want to come down to have a conversation in the chat room, uh, it's, we're at freedomslips.com and revolution.radio. And there's a place there if you can make a donation just to keep the servers running. Uh, we're all volunteers here. Nobody gets a salary. and uh, It does cost money to keep the servers running. So we appreciate anybody uh, making a contribution in whatever way you can, whether it's your attention, whether it's your, your contribution in a chat room, or whether it's with dollars. It's all the same. It's all a flow of a flow of attention. Is really what it is. And uh, I've enjoyed myself, even though I didn't have anything to say an hour ago. I seem to have done all right. So um, I think the music's going to kick in shortly. Um, I'm going to have something to eat, and then I'm going to have a wander around, see who's, on, see who's on the streets in Newcastle today. I know there was a demonstration going on. Uh, and then they may still be up there, so I'll have a quick look up and up to the monument and see if that's still going on, and do a little bit of shopping, and probably do a little bit of laundry as well this afternoon. But enjoy your day. Uh, thanks for being around. Uh, hopefully, see you again next week. And uh, that's pretty much it from me. So, ta for now.